Welcome to the Falmouth Art Center's May Virtual Art Reception. I'm Laura Reckford, Executive Director of the Falmouth Art Center, and we are recording uh, today's session because we have several people, and here's two people joining right now. We have several people who have said at the last minute they were not able to make it, and so we'll be able to uh, send them a recording of, uh, of the session. We've been doing these virtual art receptions and many of you have been along with us um, for all of these. We've been doing them since September and um, it's really been a lot of fun. It's been a great way to meet the artists who are currently displaying work here at the Falmouth Art Center, put a little context around the shows. Our three shows this month are our juried photo show in our Herman Gallery and in our Siegel Gallery, the Jeroka Collection, works by Mesha Noor. And in our Landrau Partan Gallery, we have Below the Surface, Discover, Explore, Awaken, and which is a collaboration between Hui scientists and artists from the Art League of Rhode Island. And this virtual reception will really give you an insider look at those shows for those of you who haven't come by to see the shows yet. Uh, and for even for those who have, this will give you a lot of insight into those shows. And so a few announcements for those who don't know us, the Falmouth Art Center is free and open every day to the public. You don't need to make a reservation, just come in come check out our shows. We have 36 shows a year and they change every month. So there's always something new going on here. Other things going on, we have kids and teens art and clay classes and they are getting very popular because they are in person and very safe following all the CDC guidelines. We have eight weeks of summer camps and really just a few spot, spots left in those. We are continuing our art and clay classes in person, and we also have art classes on Zoom. We also just started up weaving classes this week in person. You can check out our website for all of those. And we have two very special art talks on Zoom coming up later this month. Chris McCarthy, director of the Provincetown Art Association Museum, will talk about the 100-year-old history of the Provincetown Art Colony on Thursday, May 20th at 6.30. And we have very special guest, Dr. Nell Irvin Painter, an artist, scholar, and a historian, author of Old in Art School and the History of White People, who will be giving a talk on May 27th at 6.30. And tickets for both of those talks are on sale on our website, falmouthart.org. We have a terrific program for you today that highlights our, uh, as I said, highlights our shows that are here at the Art Center. But first, some quick Zoom tips. Many of you know all about Zoom by now, but for those who don't, um, if you could keep yourself muted, unless you have a question, and we are going to ask that people send questions through the chat, there will be plenty of time for questions after each speaker. And also, if you have a, a question during while someone is speaking, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll uh, interrupt if it is something that's timely. Um, and also, uh, we will be sharing the screen and that will show the, the you'll be in the speaker view as opposed to the gallery view for most of this session. And so you'll be able to see uh, the speakers uh, view very, very large and close up because we'll be sharing the screen. Our agenda today will start out with Mesha Noor, who will talk about her show, The Jeroka Collection. And then we'll go to Greg Anderson, who will talk about his pieces that are currently in the juried photography show. And then we'll have three artists from our collaborative show, Below the Surface, in which again, artists from the Art League of Rhode Island have collaborated with Hui scientists We'll have Lori Kaplowitz, we'll have Deb Ahrens, and we'll have Heather Stuyvesant, and they will all talk about their work in these shows, as well as the, we have the scientists on hand, and we're uh, very fortunate to have so many of the scientists as well as the, the artists in these shows on hand here, so people can ask questions about um, that exhibit, and we'll have a lot of uh, people who can explain the details of that. 
So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mesha Noor. Mesha is a self-taught artist who works in several mediums, including acrylics, oils, pen, clay, cement, and wood. Again, her one-woman show, The Jeroka Collection, is currently on view in our Siegel Gallery. She is a native of Pakistan. She visited Cape Cod as a child growing up, and a couple of years ago, she moved here to the area and now lives in Sagamore. Her current show on view is inspired by her native Pakistan and the architecture there. We are so happy that she found us here at Falmouth Art Center as her beautiful works have been very intriguing and inspirational to all of us here. So welcome, Mesha. Hi. Hi there, everybody. And I'm going to um, have you on our uh, spotlight view here as you start mm -hmm. off. And go ahead, Mesha. Hi, everyone. So my name is Misha Noor, and as Laura mentioned, my work is on display right now in the Siegel Gallery. And luckily, I've had the pleasure of talking to a lot of you guys in last month's artist talk. And I talked about my work in a lot of detail and mentioned the techniques and inspiration behind each piece. So today I thought, let's do something different. And I'll be showing you guys the works at the end, but because my work is very historically inspired, the architecture is historical, I wanted to be able to give you guys some context of that time. So we'll be just brushing upon the um, art history and like the Mughal history a little bit. So, you know, you guys have some context as to what is the era that during which, you know, these buildings were made and what's going on. So let's get started. Um, the founder of the Mughal Empire was this guy called Zahiruddin Muhammad Babur, and he is a direct descendant of Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan, which however way you want to pronounce it. And he actually had a very interesting life. He has left one of the best autobiographies, autobiographies ever written because he wrote it himself and it's very raw. As a ruler, he wrote it himself and it's called the Babur Nama. And from the get go, like if you read that book, you can start seeing how aesthetically inclined this whole family was. Like you see him mentioning, he's had a very interesting life. So if any one of you is interested, it's a good read. Um, from the get go, he mentions in one place that they're escaping a city. And in the next scene, he's mentioning how pretty the scene was that they were escaping from. And he's talking about the aesthetics. And you're just taken aback, like even during all this war and turmoil, you're looking at the beauty of things. So the family is very aesthetically inspired and Babur basically conquers parts of subcontinent or Hindustan in around 1526. And then shortly after, you know, he passes away and the empire goes to his son. It's a very shaky empire at the moment. And his son Hamayo is basically also forced out of the country due to some Afghan revolts in about 1540. And he has to take refuge with the with Shah Tahmas in Tabriz in Persia. So that's where Hamayo is introduced to this Persian style of art and he meets all these artists and he lives a couple of years over there. When after a couple of years, he comes back to the subcontinent, he reconquers it. He brings back a couple of notable artists from Persia with him, one of them being Mir Sayyid Ali of Tabriz and the other being Abdus Samad of Shiraz. And many historians consider these artists to be the, the founding members of the Mughal school of art and the style of art. And um, Hamayo also has a very short life. You know, he starts some art projects and these projects are basically them translating books and histories and illustrating them. And they're very large scale projects. It's like 1400 illustrations made on big pieces of cotton cloth and it's like 50 artists working on a single book it's like large volumes and then these works are carried forward to his son's life Akbar. Now Akbar is the emperor during whose time the Mughal empire sees some stability they finally have a strong hold and at this time you know he's able to help the empire grow and prosper and What's interesting is that in Akbar's time, you see such a cosmopolitan view of the Mughal Empire forming because he is very, very mindful of the fact that he wants to be inclusive. So he makes sure to add artists like local artists from Kashmir, from Gujarat, 
and you start seeing all this influx of Hindu inspired art merging with Persian art. And he's so inquisitive that he also actually invites European artists and art pieces to come because he wants to learn. He wants to see what is out there. And at this time you see like this golden age of the Mughal art and architecture. So most of the pieces that you'll see me make um, are buildings that were established during Akbar's time or after Akbar's time. And you see that they all have this very different sense of style. The walls are all painted and whatnot. So I also wanted to touch up upon the lives of artists during that time. And one of the really good examples is that there is a book called Ene Akbar, which is Ene Akbari, which is Institutions of Akbar. It's like his um, official book reporting the court dealings and everything, right? So in the book, Abul Fazl, the author, lists artists ranking from like the best onwards, right? So the two best artists are Mir Sayyid Ali and Abdul Samad, the ones Akbar's dad brought back from Persia. And then the third artist is Dasawanth. Now Dasawanth is a local Hindu artist, Hindu artist, and his life story is very interesting. So I thought I'd share that with you guys. So Dasawanth was the son of a planikun carrier right? Planikins are those, um, you know, like the pedestals that, you know, emperors and people would travel in and people would carry them on their backs. So he's the son of a person who carries a planikin. And he's obviously not from a rich background, you know, but he has a natural passion for drawing and patterns and design. And one day the emperor actually sees the savant drawing on the outskirts of the city wall and he actually sits and observes him for a while and he decides that this kid has a lot of potential. He has natural talent and he wants to foster it. So he basically takes him in and he gets him under the apprenticeship of Abdul Samad, the second best artist of the court. And under him, Dasaman flourishes very quickly. He quickly becomes like one of the best light artists. And he's also very innovative because Whereas the other artists are sticking to the style that they brought with them, this guy, he's innovating and he's merging all these different styles. However, his life was very, you know, ended in a very tragic way and was very short. At the age of 24, he actually stabs himself and commits suicide, dies two days later. Um, the British Journal of Psychology actually did a study on Dasa Wanth and actually kind of looked into his paintings. And they talk about how that's someone by the end, you can start seeing the mental, um, the anxiety within his mind showing into his pieces as the pieces become more morbid and more, more graphic, you know, the war scenes. But because of, you know, the lack of mental health facilities and understanding of mental, mental health issues at the time, um, it was inevitable that, you know, he would go into the cycle of self-destruction. But I still found it very interesting how at that time, there are other artists, other Hindu and Rajput and Sikh artists that, you know, that kind of joined the ranks. And um, I just found it very interesting and want to share this um, one artist's life story with you guys. And now I'm just going to screen share and I'm going to show you guys. Oh, so if any of you are interested in the sources that I used for this little history talk, you can let me know and I can point you towards them because they're all from acclaimed journals. And I'll show you guys my paintings and I'm not talking too, in too much detail about them, but if you have any questions, let me know, okay? Okay. So a lot of my paintings are actually representing the architectural style at that time and also the design elements that you see in that time. And I'm also kind of incorporating some cultural elements you see in modern day Pakistan. So these buildings, obviously you're not gonna see the whole of Pakistan having these buildings, but some of the inner cities and older parts of the cities would have these traditional buildings and they look very beautiful. And I've incorporated like this writing here says Jai Paratha, which is basically like a local snack and you're gonna see it everywhere. This is a scene from the Badshahi Masjid um, established in Mughal times. And it's kind of merged with these motifs and patterns that are also, you can find them as painted murals on the walls of these masjids and these forts. And um, they're also pa these patterns are also widely used today in Pakistan in a lot of traditional clothing. This is one of the three D pieces. This is a jaroka. This is what the whole line is actually named after. I'll have a clearer view of this coming shortly. This is made out of wood. It's all wood burnt and little pieces of wood joined together. The flowers are made out of concrete. 
These are some of the more simpler pieces just to depict some everyday women from villages over there. This piece is called the Jamni Jaroka because this again, this, this type of balcony is what a Jaroka is. It's a traditional style of balcony. And this is again, some scenes from like old cities, the Mughal older cities, which have these very intricately carved places. So this is the piece that I showed you earlier with a different angle. These are some of the smaller pieces in the line. Um, I don't have photos of the sides, but if you have a look in the Siegel Gallery, you'll see that the sides of all of these paintings are kind of, you know, they spill over. This is a Basant Chiroka. This is actually inspired, it's so colorful because of the festival of Basant that happens in the subcontinent where it's all colorful, celebrated wildly. They have kite flying and whatnot. This is from the Shahi Fort in Lahore. This is um, inspired from a photo I took myself, as are all of the other paintings as well. These are photos and like that I took myself of those areas, these angles. This is like a miniature of the blue arts that I showed you guys earlier. I wanted to have like a baby version of it because it's one of my favorite paintings. This is again a view of the Shahi Masjid. And these motifs that you see, you can also find them um, painted on the walls as murals. This scene um, is actually like a cultural representation of Pakistan because um, it mentions this is chai. So what you guys call chai tea. So if you grow up bilingual like we did, chai and tea are basically the same word. So you're just saying tea and tea. And this is something that's like a very popular drink. Like this is more popular than coffee over there. And you would see people street vendors serving them everywhere. And this is usually the scene. And I wanted to incorporate some cultural elements. This painting also has some 3D elements. These are not concrete, these are made out of clay and they're painted on to kind of blend in with the painting. Sorry. Mm, no. So these are pretty much, it. these are some paintings of the Mughal um, times that I kind of took out to show you guys that these artists had made. So I'll show you one. One thing I found very interesting. So this is one of the paintings that they painted Alexander and this is Alexander in one of the Mughal illustrations. And I found it very funny that they decided, well, we don't know what he looks like, just paint him Mughal. So he's completely like a Rajput ruler over there. And this is one of the paintings that I mentioned from the artist Dasa one that by the end it became very morbid and more graphic. So this is pretty much it. So let me know if you guys have any questions. Okay. Very beautiful work, Mesha. And we're all just um, so intrigued by it. Um, questions for Mesha while we have her. We uh, have a comment. These are beautiful. That's a Thanks. comment on, on her work. And we certainly all agree with that. And any other questions for Mesha? And if you, if you do think of them later, in the presentation at the end, we'll, we'll come back to Mesha. But um, now's your chance to ask questions if you have any questions now for her. And um, here's, here's a question. Um, what is the painting right behind you is the question. Um, so this is um, one of the pieces I did inspired by truck art in Pakistan. So it's, um, it's a very cultural thing where these truck owners, it's a sign of pride and glory for them to have this beautifully decorated truck. And you'll see a lot of patterns like this, which are bold and colorful. And so this is one of the pieces I did inspired from that. It's heavily patterned. So if you look, if you zoom in closer, you'll see that even the smallest nooks and crannies are like filled with pattern. Um, it's from a different line. That's why it's not included in the display over there. How do you decide on the composition? So. So the inspiration starts when, I, when I, I personally like to visit these places first and then take photos according to the angles that I like best. And I'm also very attracted towards these different geometrical angles. So once I have like a photo or like an angle that, I'm, that I like, I honestly, I just start with the painting. I pick a corner of a canvas and I just start painting. And by the time that I'm done, because I'm using different mediums. So I start with the sketching part, which I do with pen because I can get a lot of detail in it. And as I'm making it, I just 
the ideas from these other motifs and these murals that I've seen along the walls and these tradition, traditional patterns, um, you know, this kind of start making sense and fit into the painting. The only thing that I think of before I started is like the size and also maybe the color scheming. So say if I want to go with something blues and then the patterns and all the other colors will just fit in, but that might be the dominant color. And everything else is just, I just start and it just, you know, it's very hard to explain. <laughs> No, that was a great explanation and it's it's fascinating. And so thank you so much, Mesha. And again, we can return to Mesha at the end, um, but we will now uh, go on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Mesha. And, um, and now to Greg Anderson. So at the Art Center, we know Greg as a wonderful volunteer serving on committees, helping us with projects when we need photography as he did today all morning. Um, and he, but he has had a distinguished career as a photojournalist and his award-winning photos are often on display here in shows at the Falmouth Art Center. So I will let him tell you more about himself and his career and he'll also show you works from the current show. So welcome Greg, I'm gonna spotlight Greg, here he is. There we go, and now you're spotlighted. Thank you, Laura. It's 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 an honor to be associated with the Art Center. Um, I do enjoy it so much. Um, as Laura said, um, I had a, a career as a photojournalist. Um, I started out oh, as a junior in high school and went through went to a very small school of about four hundred in rural Missouri in the Ozarks um, and started in the photography program at this at high school and they got me a job at a local newspaper and I was the first person to be in what they called then a work experience program um, and from from my hometown newspaper I went to the Palm Beach Post to the Miami Herald to the Anchorage Daily News in Alaska Dallas Morning News in Dallas uh, Detroit News um, the Tacoma News Tribune in just south of Seattle uh, back to Dallas and finally ended up spending 20 some years at the Seattle Times um, working and supporting photo and photo technology. Um, so my foray into art photography is something I started since we retired in 2016. And as a photojournalist, I'm kind of a purist. So I still have a hard time, you know, moving things and taking things out of pictures, but I'm, I'm learning. Um, so one of my uh, pieces here, and I'm also involved in the Upper Cape Camera Club, which is a great camera club uh, based in Falmouth, and we often meet when we can in person at the Art Center. Um, obviously this year it's all been via Zoom. Um, so I, I wanted to show you um, a couple of pictures that are in the, in the show and how one of them evolved. So I'll share my screen here. So I was out for a hike um, up in New Hampshire over the over the winter, or probably last fall, um, and found this leaf um, very intriguing um, with all the water droplets on it. And then I took, well, it's not a not a great picture. So I ended up um, cutting just the leaf out um, and multiplying it in different sizes and different ways on the screen and colorized it. And then I decided we had a, uh, a speaker at the camera club that's talked about putting backgrounds behind pictures and, and doing fun things with pictures. So I grabbed a picture um, and this, when it's sharp is actually a, um, a geyser pool at Yellowstone. And I blurred the geyser pool and then meshed the two together to get this picture. Um, that's in the show. So I call it Fall Leaves. Uh, the other one that's in the show is more my photojournalism side. I got a new telephoto lens um, and wasn't quite happy with how sharp it was. So I was trying to dial in the sharpness and went down to the Cape Cod Canal, which is about a mile from my house. Um, and it was perfectly flat and smooth, you know, it's slack tide and a foggy day. And I was intrigued by these, by the waterfowl 
that always dive into the water to, you know, go down to the bottom to catch fish or, or plants or whatever. And I said, hmm, I wonder if I can get them in the middle of a dive. And so after about 500 shots, uh, thank God for digital photography these days, because you can throw them all away. Um, I, I captured this uh, red-breasted merganser um, taking a dive. And, you know, this is about a four thousandth of a second. Um, because I knew it had to be really a fast shutter speed to capture them. Um, and I was very fortunate there was nothing else in the background, no waves um, or anything. And I just, I just love the fact that I, I caught it. So this, as Laura said, this is in the show. It won best uh, motion picture in the show. So, um, but, you know, I, I, I enjoy the photography. I enjoy um sharing what I know about computers and, uh, and technology. Um, and for the last 20 years at the Seattle Times, I was in charge of their archives. Um, in fact, they just called me the other day and needed some PDFs of pages out of their archive system. So I still log in and consult with them once in a while. But, um, you know, the storage of all these photos is, is a huge um, issue. You know, and I've learned to, you know, store some stuff on backup drives. Um, I also upload all my photos to the cloud, you know, just in case the house burns down or, you know, a drive fails, um, which is always happening. So I'm very cautious about where I put the photos. So um, Great. Pick, uh, questions. Yes. Yeah, so we have so, a question has come in asking if the diving merganser photo is altered at all. It is not. It is absolutely not. It is the way I photographed it. Um, in the one at, uh, no, this is this one is not. Now, what I did do is dodge and burn, um, but otherwise, it's just as I shot it. So, like I said, I'm I'm kind of a purist um, and still learning this art photography thing. So, um, once in a while, I get to do something pure like this. Um, for those who don't know what dodge and burn is, maybe you can explain. Oh, yeah, lightening certain areas and darkening other areas um, to make certain areas like, you know, the the under the under the duck uh, show up a little bit better instead of being in shadow. Um, so that's a um, common thing that photojournalists do just to basically sharpen the picture. Yeah. Um, that's here's about a question. I'm sorry. I was going to say that's about all you're allowed to do as a photojournalist mm -hmm. for newspapers and magazines. So yeah, just just sharpen it up. Here's a question about she wants to see the other pieces you have on your desktop, <laughs> but um, uh, that might take all day. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the only other ones I have on the desktop were the the, the other four in the sequence to create the fall leaves. So okay, I, I tried to get a nice clean desktop here. So. Okay, very good. Um, any other questions for Greg? I'm going to remove the spotlight to see if anyone has their hands up here for other questions for Greg, because sometimes people raise their hand instead of using the chat. Um, I don't see any. So thank you so much, Greg. That was fascinating. And if people think of questions for Greg, uh, he can he will be here at the end and you can ask them at the end. And so now we go to the artists in our special collaborative show, Below the Surface, in which the Art League of Rhode Island has collaborated with scientists from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And it's a very intriguing show. And this is the kind of show where people walk in here to the Art Center and just say, wow, they are people are really blown away by it. Um, this project is called Synergy, and it started way back in 2013. The results of the first collaboration were shown at the Museum of Science in Boston and also the New Bedford Museum of Art back in 2014. And so we're really glad they approached us here at the Falmouth Art Center to show Synergy 2, as this is called, this, which is the second round of these collaborations. And we have a number of the artists and scientists, maybe almost all of them, here on this Zoom call, which is great. 
And so we're going to start with presentations from three of the artists and some of the scientists also who were involved. And uh, we'll start with Lori Kaplowitz. And Lori was a participant in the original 2013 Synergy. And she's working with her scientist partner is Jennifer Kenyon, who is actually uh, currently on an ocean expedition in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So she's not here with us. But Lori is joining us here from her. She lives in the south end of Boston. And so welcome, Lori. Thank you. You took away my first lines, but <laughs> that's OK. Um, yes, my name is Lori Kaplowitz, and I'm a painter. And I'm a retired professor of painting and drawing from UMass Dartmouth. Um, my science partner is Jennifer Kenyon. And as Laura said, she's out at sea somewhere in the Atlantic now. So I'm wearing both hats today. <clears throat> um, I did participate in the first Synergy project and that was such a good experience that I jumped at the opportunity to do this one. Jennifer and I decided to create a graphic storybook. And when we started communicating, which has only been by Zoom um, so far, we found out some things about each other. Um, I found out that she's a huge graphic novel fan. And I told her that for the past few years with an artist collaborator, I've been working on an installation in the form of a 3D graphic novel, such that you, the viewer will feel as if he or she is walking through the pages of a book. Um, Jennifer's research deals with the carbon cycle um, and radioactivity, and specifically the radioactive element of thorium. And she uses thorium to measure, and um, she uses it to measure the amount and the rate at which carbon drops to the bottom of the ocean. She deals with a few very strong natural forces in her research, such as radioactivity and the carbon pump, and they're not very visual. So our challenge was to find um, a way to embody these forces and make very memorable images from them. Um, the first thing I asked her to do was to take her research and if she could um, condense it in a way that she could lay it out over um, 10 pages in small blocks of text, very digestible blocks of text. Um, and what she came up with was this template, and you can see usually three blocks to a page, sometimes four blocks. Um, and this is what we've been working with. Um, we started by thinking we would like to um, create a hero's journey, that classic format. And um, her research really didn't have the dramatic arc for that. And there was too much twisting and twerking, trying to find a, trying to fit a round thing into a square thing. But what all that work, um, derived for us was the idea of personification. Um, I thought that if we could personify some of these forces, um, that that would be a way to make memorable images and very strong imagery. So the first thing I did was, I, this is a painting that's in the show, but I have a print of it here in case you haven't seen the show yet. Um, I saw carbon as a juggler because I either learned or relearned from this that we live in a closed system and the amount of carbon has always been the same. It just recirculates. It goes from the earth into the atmosphere, back into the ocean over and over again. So I saw that as a figure juggling atoms of carbon. Um, and the next, I'm going to stand up now, the, the next image I tried was, there's a, 
a piece of text in the book that where Jen says it's effective, um, the ocean effectively breathes in and out CO2 as the climate warms and cools, buffering the effect of CO2. So I saw the ocean and I personified it as a sleeping woman. Um, so here she's breathing into the atmosphere and inverted here, she's breathing into the ocean and the atoms of carbon go round and round. Um, the next uh, thing that we tried was, this is thorium and thorium is the um, radioactive element that has a half-life. So we saw it as a timekeeper because it attaches itself to carbon in the ocean and it in itself decays over time becoming actually another element but it's uh, through the through that those time sequences she can uh, gather a whole wealth of data so i made him into this timekeeper uh, painted him in a way where he is like a photographic negative he suggesting some kind of irradiation Here's his stopwatch for keeping time. He's doing all of these calculations and the spackling behind him uh, suggests the uh, constant radi uh, decay that goes on with radioactivity. Uh, there's a piece of her research that uh, speaks of climate change and uh, since the turn of the century, the uh, unleashing of all this carbon through the burning of fossil fuels. I got interested in the idea of shadow play, you know, when you go like this and shine a light and the image that's projected is actually very different from what the form is. So I used that idea. These are what I call baby carbons, um, maybe carbon from an earlier time, but they're wearing the same uh, costume that the juggler is. So hopefully you can associate um, the two. And they're playing with kids' toys and the shadows that are projected on the surface behind them um, suggest this uh, proliferation, exaggeration, this horror show that's going on. So the paper airplane becomes the jets and the blocks become the smokestacks. The dinosaur becomes the oil derricks and the monster dinosaurs. And I'm not sure if I'm the only one, but every time I hear fossil fuels, I think of dinosaurs, although I'm totally aware of the fact that it refers to any carbon-based life that ever was. Um, I'd like to say a few words about my artistic decisions and choices. Um, since we're dealing with the deep ocean where there's no light and no color, um, I'm using a palette of black and white and shades of gray, which I feel is appropriate. And if you'll notice, there are a lot, mostly circles, spheres, arcs. That's a unifying a motif uh, to collect the whole body of work. And it also refers to the, the cycle that we're actually talking about. And finally, um, Jen and I, from the beginning, had this overriding goal of making this an educational tool. We, um, we intend to print a small um, hard copy edition, but ideally and ultimately, uh, we want a digital format so that it can be widely distributed to a larger audience um, and um, accessible to possibly library systems, um, school systems. Um, that's what we're, we're really hoping for. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, and I think if we've not, got a question you. coming in. Thank you so much, Lori. That's fascinating and, and the pictures are amazing. Um, first question is what medium are Lori's paintings? They're all acrylic. Just black and white acrylic paint. That's it. Other questions for Lori. Here's one. Wonderful conceptions. What materials did you use? So that's sort of a similar question, but. Could I add something? I'll do it really quickly. Sure. Um, all of these paintings um, 
have been or are going to be um, enhanced and manipulated a bit digitally. For instance, the painting that's in the show of the juggler, there are just little white balls that he's juggling. But this, this image, I don't know if you can see it over here, is my vision of a carbon atom, like a cluster of pearls. And I can put it on the computer on a transparent um, layer. And anybody who knows Photoshop knows that you can make things bigger, smaller, lighter, darker. And then I can just kind of pop them in wherever I want. Um, so that happens in a lot of these images. This, this image, which is uh, looking at nature through binoculars, there's a piece of the text that says that, um, doesn't exist at all. It's just all Photoshopped from uh, some of these images, some of these uh, single, I just took photographs of them and popped them in and, and work um, images from my whole body of work because uh, I've always painted birds and plants and flowers and shells and things, so. Here's another question. How was it to work with a scientist? Uh, it was, um, I, it's just amazing to me that Jen and I have not met in person yet. We've worked incredibly well um, via Zoom. Uh, now that we're both vaccinated and as soon as she comes back, I'm really looking, forward so much to working in person. Um, she, she's been just fabulous to work with. She's, I, and I, I don't know if I said this, I can't remember. She's writing the text, I'm doing the images. That's, that's the 50-50 partnership. So that answers another question that came in about who wrote the text. And here's a question, will you be exhibiting the original paintings in Synergy shows? Um, I, that, there are two in the exhibit at Falmouth and the other uh, pieces there are possible page layouts. So we just printed them and mounted them. Um, but I, it, I, it dawned on me l afterwards that it would be uh, a good idea to put some original paintings in there. So the answer to that is yes. <laughs> Very good. And other questions for Lori while well, we have her and she'll be here at the end if people think of questions as we continue. So thank you so much, Lori. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Oh, we have, yes, Claudia. <laughs> Lori, your, your work is gorgeous. Will you. you please let us know when it's going to be published? You know, maybe let Laura know, right? And while I have the screen, I wanted to share some other things too. I came in today to see everybody's work just for this. Mesha, your work is gorgeous, beautiful. And I love the way that you put several different scenes in one painting. And you're also very brave about leaving empty space. Very nice. Greg, your duck photograph is incredible. Abs that should have gotten first prize. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you. And I wanted to say to Charlotte, who's not on this program, but is in the audience, that I visited the Circe show and her painting is outstanding. Yay, Charlotte. Yes, we have, we have really a lot of wonderful artwork here at the Art Center today. So Claudia, thank you so much for looking at everything today and weighing in. Now we have another question that just came in for Lori. Does art clarify or amplify science or does science enhance art? That's somewhat of an essay question coming in here. I, I would say the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes to both. Yes and both. I don't mean to be flip. I truly believe that. So, well, Lori, thank you so much. I'm sure there'll You're be welcome. other questions and comments for Lori as we move on. And so next we have Deb Ahrens, who lives just over the bridge in Dartmouth, I believe. And she's working on what will be a moving fabric sculpture, we weaving a connection of whaling log entries and data points in today's climate models that define marine heat waves. 
And this is illustrating the work of Huey scientists, Dr. Caroline Ummenhofer and Dr. Svenja Ryan. And we have both scientists here today as well as Deb. And so um, they wanted to actually start with the two scientists. So we're going to um, bring them up first to, to start speaking and then we'll, we'll go on to Deb. So we'll start with Caroline. I'm going to um, uh, highlight Caroline and Svenja. And um, hopefully you both are still here. Here's Caroline I see right here. And now I'm going to find Svenja, hopefully as well. Whoops, I might not be able to find Svenja. But um, Svenja has started screen sharing, so we'll hear from them. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. I'm Caroline, uh, and I'm an oceanographer and climate scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic. Um, my research uh, tries to understand the ocean's role in global climate. How does the ocean affect, um, in particular, rainfall, droughts, floods, and how can we better um, understand those? So I'm really interested in extreme events, extreme events on land. But for this particular uh, project, we've actually focused on extreme events in the ocean. So it's a really new research area, uh, recognizing that it's not just um, extreme events that can happen on land, that's what we observe because uh, that's where we live, but the ocean can actually experience extreme events uh, as well, in particular heat waves. And so this image here um, shows um, marine heat waves. And as the name implies, it's, it's very, very warm temperatures for a sustained period of time that have occurred over the last decade or so all around the world. And so all these red areas are different marine heat waves uh, that have occurred and they can have uh, really big implications. And um, better understanding them um, is the work that uh, Svenja actually works on. And I'm, I'm going to hand over to her. She's going to tell you more about that. Um, and I'm okay. gonna remove uh, Caroline's spotlight because I think when Svenja speaks, we will, we will see her then. So let's see if that works. And Svenja, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, Does very good, there? perfect. Now we see Svenja. Okay. Yes, um, hello everyone. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Woods Hole Oceanographic and I'm also a physical oceanographer. And as Caroline said, I'm particularly interested in these marine heat waves, which are extreme events in the ocean. Um, and particularly, I'm interested in um, seeing their depth extent in the ocean. So we can measure the surface with satellites, but these cannot look you know, beneath the surface. So we're actually using global ocean simulations to analyze these events and what may drive them um, on a regional scale. And in particular, this event in 2012 in the Northwest Atlantic, and there's a little um, map here that highlights these temperature anomalies in 2012. And some of you might remember that in 2012, actually there was an overload of lobster in the region and lobster prices dropped and they were everywhere. And this was um, associated with these anomalously warm temperatures that led to early landings, um, which is shown here in the bottom curve of these lobsters in May. And actually the peak, which is this gray line, was way above the average conditions that people um, were used to. And this led to a whole economic tensions between the US and Canada um, and was therefore a very impactful event. So understanding these events um, is important for the ecosystem, for local economies, and has really been a hot topic in science um, in recent years. And um, I think the art that Deb has generated from this is just um, magnificent. And, um, She'll um, introduce you to that now. And the collaboration has been wonderful. Okay, so now we'll turn it over to Deb. Thank you, Caroline and Svenja. And now I'm going to highlight Deb here. And let's see, here she is. So I'm going to do that. And welcome, Deb. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, this has been 
a wonderful project uh, to work on. And I'm so grateful to all the people that have helped make it happen. Um, we started last August with um, many conversations and uh, over time, Svenja and Caroline, you know, they gave me technical papers and we talked and I began to grasp some elements of their research. Um, and there were repeating themes that kept coming up uh, that I knew I had to incorporate in whatever it was I was going to create. And, you know, one of the first things was the whole idea of scale. Um, they deal with massive amounts of data. They are dealing with massive systems of moving water and air, trying to understand them. Um, and I was really taken by the whole notion of these marine heat waves newly, newly understood and defined simply by the ability to analyze numbers. Um, it's driven by numbers. Um, and it's a, in computer code, you know, so like I kept thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I knew that that had to be part of it. It had to be moving. Um, and when I learned about Caroline's research with a historian from the New Bedford Whaling Museum to create more data sets derived from weather in old whaling logs to create data sets that go backwards in time. Um, I just, I, I had this just incredible frisson of the, of the past reaching out to the present. Um, and I just, I said, well, that has to be part of it. And, you know, as a child growing up in New Bedford, every field trip I ever took in elementary school was to the whaling museum. <laughs> so it just, it had this particularly uh, meaningful thing to me. And, um, but we talked a lot about the artistic process and the scientific process and the overlap and the, and the challenge of how you communicate your story, whether it's visually as an artist or as a scientist. And um, I spent a lot of time looking at the video of um, an exhibit that was at the Boston, Co Boston College about Caroline's work in the Indian Ocean and the complex graphics and how they tried to convey that. And um, so all this is swirling around and I'm still thinking, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And, and then I asked them each, what, what drives you? What motivates you? What is at the heart that makes you, you know, seek out this data and try and understand it? And, and for both of them, it is the thrill of finding something new that, you know, they, they are explorers and that just, it circled back to that theme of being an explorer and how we understand our world. And so I had to become an explorer. I'm a fine art photographer. I usually work flat, you know, in a frame. And so everything you see behind me um, are the prototypes and scale models for what is going to be um, a series of little moving marine heat waves. Um, I'm going to share my screen and show you what uh, is one of my studies that's in the show. And then I'm going to show you some of the more developed pieces. Um, Oops, hang on. Here we go. Are you all seeing that? Okay. Yes, we're seeing that. Okay. So you can, oh, and one of the other things that we talked about a lot was um, engaging people in conversation about this scientific research. So, um, in my mind, it had to also be very colorful. It had to be something that could draw people, young people and old people into it. Um, so on each of the panels, one side uses a standard oceanographic, uh, a, great, a color gradient used for oceanographic data that is yellow to blue. 
and the other side is a yellow to purple kind of gradient and um, you can see in this one, this is some of um, Svenja's actual code. You can see lobsters. You can see some of the charts and maps that are in there. Um, I chose to use um, the drawings of naturalist explorers um, as a, another element that brings the past to the present in addition to um, stuff from the whaling logs. And uh, uh, let me go to the next. Um, and this is an example with some of the same elements where you can see the squid. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard the expression of the calamari comeback in Rhode Island. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a lot more squid in Rhode Island waters thanks to some of these temperature changes in the waters. This. Um, these garfish were never seen up here until fairly recently, starting in 2012. So um, these, all of the panels, you know, have different elements of the stories that are uh, things that we've talked about. Uh, it's fascinating how they're taking the entries from the whaling logs taking all the terms for describing the wind and the weather, matching them to the actual Beaufort scale to become a data point. Um, and uh, so these are little clips from some of the other panels. This, uh, this is one that has all of Svenja's code that uh, shows all of these extreme events from 2012 through, I think it's June of last year. Um, and you can see the ones that are marked strong and severe and how many days and, you know, again, the lobsters that were so significantly impacted. But these events happen all around the world on the West Coast. Kelp forests have become um, sea urchin deserts. Uh, so just try to combine a lot of different images and elements to tell a variety of stories that will move and uh, weave with one another um, in these moving panels. Uh, and as you can see the one spinning behind me, they bend. And uh, it was very important to me that things bend, that they moved at the back and the fronts talk to each other, that there's this Kind of moving chaos that you have in the ocean. Um, so that's that's where I'm heading. <laughs> Great, wonderful. And questions for Deb. The work is amazing. I'm going to throw out a question, which is, can you talk about your your mediums that you're using? Because you talked about being a fine art photographer, but obviously this is very different. Um, it, it, it is very different, but it, it also follows a long line. I, I have designed silk scarves. I do a lot of layering in my work. I have a whole body of work that's about the dialogue when botanical material is put in moving water and what is that conversation like? So that understanding of layers and how things move and how you build depth is very much a part of my other work. Um, but I've been a journalist, I've been a teacher and in, in listening to what it is they want out of that and how do you distill complex things in ways that engage people is what kind of drove me. Um, very good. Other questions for Deb? Questions about Deb's work? I'm sure people are trying to process because there's so Ooh. much going on there. Um, and uh, here's a question coming in. How big will the final pieces be? Um, this one behind me is to scale. There's actually an eight foot rod in there. So by the time it bends, it's about four feet from top to bottom. 
And uh, in this first go around, I'm doing five of them. And, you know, our hopes are to link a lot of this content to the Synergy website uh, so that if you see something, you can, it, there's been a lot of talk of using QR codes. Um, and so you can hopefully see sea urchins and learn something about sea urchins or be directed to a resource to learn more about some of these things. Very good. I have a comment. Yes, please. I feel as though the three of you have introduced me, walked me into a new and fascinating world. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I certainly agree with that. This is just all um, pretty mind blowing, actually, and just so, so interesting. Other questions? Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come through now, but I'm sure there might be some that people think of, and I know you'll stay with us. And oh, so- Can I say yes. just one more thing? Yes. Um, these panels will be on display in New Bedford uh, in the month of June as part of DATMA, Design, Art and Technology, uh, the whole month of June in New Bedford has a whole lot of events around that, so. That's great. And so if you can kind of keep in touch with me on that, I can email that out to the group okay. as well. Um, and here's another question. What causes the hot spots in the ocean and why are they clinging to the coasts? I guess that's a question for our two scientists. I can try um, to answer that. So there can be multiple drivers to these heat waves and also one heat wave, you know, can have multiple drivers. They can be, for example, driven by the atmosphere. So if you have anomalously warm temperature in the atmosphere, some of that heat will go into the ocean and heat it up. But it can also be ocean internal processes, such as a current might be transporting more and more water than usual, um, or some of the mixing processes might change. And this is really a challenge of trying to figure out what's driving these hotspots. Um, and these events that were shown on the map, I guess they are mostly um, along the coast, but they can actually happen anywhere in the ocean. The question is where will they have most impact and for me in particular you know this topic is so interesting because there is a di direct link um, or potential link to the ecosystem and the local coastal communities um, and this is again also one of the challenges to investigate the impact of these heat waves on regional um, ecosystems and economies and so i guess that's why these coastal heat waves were popped up um, or shown mostly on the figure. Thank you very much. And here's another question coming in. Are you involving warm core rings into your work? Your spirals bring those to mind. Very much so. Um, I initially thought that all of the, the ones happening here off of our coast were caused by these warm core rings till I was corrected uh, in my uh, not deep understanding of, of these extreme events. Um, but that was very much part of this design was, was that, that rotating movement um, of the core rings. And that's part of our um, current work, all of my work. I'm trying to figure out if these warm core rings can contribute to some of these heat waves, in particular subsurface heat waves that might not be detected from the surface so that we can intrude this warm water below the surface onto the continental shelf. Very good. And so if people have other questions, they will all be here. Um, uh, as we as we reach the end, people can can have more questions. But we do have one more presenter in the uh, the group of scientists and artists. We have Heather Stivison, who is working with Noah Paul Germolis, and uh, they are both here. Um, and the, Heather is seeking to illustrate Noah's work on ocean metabolites in order to understand the life cycle of these basic building blocks of life. Welcome, Heather. Hi. 
Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here and I'm really, really enjoying this project. Um, as uh, Lori said, my name is Heather Stuyvesant and I'm working with NOAA. And um, I wanna share my screen, so give me one second. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I apologize. Let me try that again. <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. Okay, there we go. So um, I wanted to start a little bit to tell you about myself. I am originally from New Jersey, where I worked as a museum director for a number of years. And I've moved up to Massachusetts fairly recently to um, go to UMass Dartmouth and complete an MFA in painting, as opposed to being, being someone looking at the work and talking about the work, I would be making the work. But I've actually been a creator all my life. Um, I worked in uh, any number of fields in art and have um, done a, a ton of work. This is a little corner of my studio. This is the neat corner. And you can see I'm an interdisciplinary artist. I work in all kinds of media, uh, painting, ink, um, fiber sculpture, uh, found objects, and um, have been having a blast since I got back to my studio time. Most of my artwork relates to either uh, feminism or the environment, two topics that interest me a great deal. And uh, the place where I'm most comfortable in my work is sort of standing on the threshold between abstraction and reality. So I use elements of reality or realism so that I can draw a viewer in who may not have an interest or knowledge of full abstraction. And then they can spend a little more time looking at the work and they may see something else. And it offers me the chance to uh, bring a new perspective and um, offer new dialogues and new ideas in my work. In the uh, past few years, my work has been exhibited in universities, galleries, and museums, both nationally and internationally, and that's been very exciting. My environmental paintings are mostly derived from my responses to water, clouds, and constellations. But as you can see from this work, I'm not trying to recreate or illustrate the places. I want to paint something that I feel from it, something that is unseen. And my work is often inspired by poetry. I use an awful lot of layers of semi-transparent oil paint uh, and try to invite the eye to travel around and through the paint and to encourage a little contemplation. And uh, in relation to uh, Deb's project before, this one, um, you can see the line here, this separation of the two worlds. This is not part of what I plan to say, but this is related to the hot zones in the ocean. And it was the deterioration of um, the, the coast that I was talking about. So I thought it was interesting seeing your work on that same topic. And I often create um, in the abstractions a sort of unsettling depth, something that is a little bit, can be a little bit disturbing. You're not really sure what you're looking at, or it can be dreamlike or sometimes nightmare-like. Um, the most important subject in my work has been water, and it has been water for several years. Uh, in addition to its central role in life, it plays an essential role in the spiritual lives of humans. We think of it in uh, baptisms and cleansing rituals and in sacred ceremonies. And it's incredibly mysterious when, because when we look at water, we don't actually see the water is colorless, it's formless. So what we see is here you see the reflections of the sky or the world around it, or here you can see, you can look through it and you see what is tinting the water, the chemicals within it, or what is beneath the water. And so in my work, I've been calling these the, the mirrors and the windows. And this project is particularly interesting to me because it looks into the windows of the ocean with the eyes of the scientist to see the secret world that's beneath it. 
And science is something that has always been important to me. It's, I've been around it my whole life. This is my dad. He was a research scientist in physics. And on the right is my daughter. She's a molecular biologist at Vanderbilt University now. So the Synergy Project, which blends art and science and focuses on water was the perfect fit for my work. So this sort of brings me to this other section of my studio, the messier section. And you can see some of the work that is based on water. And you'll notice that a lot of it is based on the surface patterns. And this is the beginning of one of the works that's in the exhibit now, and a much earlier version of the, another one that's in the exhibit now. And I did focus generally before meeting Noah on the mirrors, the reflections, the patterns. But as I began to uh, learn about Noah's re research, I was excited to find that his four areas in the ocean, the places that he's getting his samples, would give us into the window of the life of unseen chemicals in the ocean. The very idea of the life of a chemical was intriguing. And to know that all of this was happening and we couldn't see it and I could somehow represent it in abstract art was very exciting. So I decided to create four paintings, four large scale paintings, each one based on his four collection sites, beginning with a coastal surface water. Noah described this site as active water, full of movement with vibrant areas of bloom and bust, rich in mixtures of both land derived and oceanic molecules. And he said, this is where we would find pharmaceuticals and pollutants and harmful toxins and where nutrients are often amplified by human activity. And he called it a green algae filled mess. So this is where I started with the mess. And the more he described the chemical life in this zone, the more I saw these wild and crazy colors and textures in my mind. So I painted these chemicals as kind of living communities and all sort of connecting with each other and overlapping, but as different communities. And the surface paint you'll see is bumpy and rough with the evidence of growth and the interconnectedness of these chemicals. And eventually I had this abstraction of entire communities of chemicals that we don't see with our eyes. And um, I, was, I was pleased with that, but I knew that nobody would look at this and have any idea that it was underwater. So I needed something to trigger the idea of water in our minds. So going back to the concept of the windows and mirrors, I decided to create these sort of cloud-like forms, paint them right on the top. And these imaginary shapes work in such a way that our human mind recognizes that this represents water, that it represents the surface of the water, even though they're just imaginary forms. And even though it's a total abstraction and bears no real physical relation to water, we see it as water, we can even feel it as wet. Now a second collection zone is also surface water, but it's far out in the ocean and it could not have been more different. He found that there really wasn't much of anything in that water except salt. And we spoke of this as an ocean desert. So here's the earliest iteration of the second panel. I laid in a foundation of uh, paint that is not textured. You can see the canvas is fairly smooth and the colors are gradually graded from the warm to the cool. And that change in color represents the oscillation that he described between day and night. And in particular, um, the dissolved riboflavin that is found near the surface in the safety of the night, but then that, that retreats down below when the sun comes up again. He described the metabolites as being like speech. And I love this. He says they're full of information easily assimilated and transient in nature. They tend to be used almost as soon as they are released and don't accumulate much. This along with his other desert type descriptions, including a comparison to tumbleweed, made me think of the sun-dried bones in an actual desert. They're full of biological information. They break down, they get bleached in the relentless sunlight. So I wanted to underscore that desert concept and I took those original lines that represented the, the water and I made them look more like bones. And eventually I took some images of the interior of bones, microscopic images, and uh, you'll see them in the later version of this painting. 
this painting has none of the um, communities of active life that was found in the coastal, other coastal painting. You'll see some heat, you'll see a sense of loneliness. And if you get very close, you'll see some marks. It doesn't show up as well in this picture as it does in the real painting. But when you look at the marks, the temptation is to just wipe them off, like there's something that doesn't belong there. But they're intentional and they refer to the degradation products of marine molecules, uh, marine microbes that he spoke about. So the finished painting, you can see the interior of the bones up here. And it looks deceptively simple when it's compared to the other panel, but there's a lot of storytelling going on. The warm and cool colors that I mentioned before and the reference to deserts and bones are part of it. But there's also a sense of directional movement of the water. You sense it going off to the one side and the, um, the feel of the waving and the bobbing surface and the receding patterns give you a little bit of a sense of the, the vastness of the space. And both of these paintings, the scale is really important to me. When completed, the whole series will include four of these five foot paintings. And it will require the visitors to physically walk from zone to zone and they can move up close and, and get some look into the, um, into the windows. And then they can step back and get a sense of the size of the ocean. Both of the paintings use uh, fantasy abstractions that somehow our human brain comprehends to represent the water. I'm very interested in distilling the subjective world into color, form, and light, and exploring how our brain responds and how we read the visual language of art. I hope the work sparked conversations about the relationships between art and science and remind us of the value of seeking to understand our world better. So I'd like to turn this over to Noah for just a minute to, to get a few thoughts from him. Great, and I will um, remove the spotlight on you. Thank you, Heather. And I'm going to spotlight Noah, um, who I think is here. here. Here he is. Okay, let me get that going. There we go. Hello, Noah. Hi. Hi. I guess to begin, I, I'm Noah. I'm a third year PhD student in the joint program uh, studying chemical oceanography. You heard a little bit about that from Heather. Uh, specifically, one of the things that I'm interested in is what's in the water and why is it there at the concentrations that it is? And we can have an answer for that that spans geologic timescales when we're talking about things like, like chloride, sodium, the stuff that makes the ocean salty, things that are common and stay there for a long time. But when it comes to these transient chemical species, the organic chemicals, things that your body might recognize, amino acids, nucleotides, the building blocks of cells, we see that those are there even at vanishingly small concentrations, even in the surface ocean near Bermuda in the middle of the Atlantic, where it's hard for a lot of microbes to live. And this, this, the presence of these biomolecules there is the focus of my research. Uh, and one of the things that I'm interested in is the fact that these chemicals are all reactive characters themselves. Oftentimes what we view them as is something where one cell might need more of something and one cell might produce an excess of something and they form a network of interacting characters that are shooting chemicals back and forth. But what of, oftentimes we fail to consider is what happens to those chemicals when they're in the water. Um, there are things that I'm studying, uh, for example, a lot of the nucleotides, things that make up your DNA or um, tryptophan and amino acid that absorb light. If you have sunlight shining on them, they can actually absorb some of that radiation and react, becoming perhaps something new or something that uh, a cell would not recognize. And so some of the fundamental questions that my research is asking is, if you live in the surface ocean, are you competing with physical chemistry to obtain nutrients you need to live? That's a lot of what's going on here, but for, for this project, um, Heather has been doing a tremendous amount of learning about, about microbial ecosystems, about how they work in different places and about the, the, the stuff of life uh, in the ocean. What I've been trying to do uh, in addition to that is uh, take some of the data that I have, which is chemical data. It comes off of a machine called a, um, a liquid chromatography coupled mass spectrometry 
uh, apparatus and uh, convert that data, which just tells you relatively how much of, a, of these chemicals are in the water in a sample that you took. And I've taken those, those relative measures of abundance and converted them to music um, by taking things that are more abundant and saying this corresponds to a higher, a more intense pitch and things that are less abundant and say, well, these correspond to lower pitches and arranging them to hopefully have something musical. These are not on display yet and they're still a work in progress, but um, like, like Heather mentioned, there are going to be four paintings and eventually there will be accompanying music. Here's a, a sample of what one of those looks like. Um, and the, the recordings are in progress. So I'm very excited about all of that. Very fascinating. And uh, the, I'm sure people have questions for Heather and Noah. And I'm watching the chat here and also the gallery to see if any hands are up. Uh, questions for Heather and Noah who are here. Oh, I see a, I see a question from Paul Lombardozzi. Paul, you want to take yourself off mute there? I have a question for Noah. Um, is there an interdependency from the some sea life that's dependent upon those chemicals that you see and are they um, excrements of sea life that add to those chemical bodies that you find? Yes, uh, it is a, a complex and messy network. And the, the yeah. weird thing is that down at like a, at the level of like single celled plankton, you have situations that are kind of funny. Like there are these dominant phytoplankton that might be there like, um, you know, kind of like single celled plants that live in the ocean uh, doing the photosynthesis that forms that, that first biomass, the primary production that everything else depends upon. And one of the things that's funny about them is that there are many phytoplankton species that can't produce the B vitamins they need to live. They have to get those from bacteria and the bacteria might excrete them. They might um, produce them inside the cells, but then blow up when they get infected by a virus and scatter that stuff to the wind. Uh, and then there's also some just absolutely fascinating research going on about basically like do copepods like tiny little shrimpy looking things, do they pee out these nutrients when they go down to depth to, um, to hide out during the day? They, yeah. <laughs> so they come from a lot of places and not everyone can make the ingredients they need to live. How broad do you have to research under your, the things that you're studying um, into the oceans? I mean, various, I, are the components in various parts of the ocean, do they differ a whole lot? They do. Like, uh, yeah, okay. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that, like when, when Heather was showing off kind of the, the surface ocean in the oligotrophic, like nutrient poor gyre region in the middle of the ocean versus the coast, uh, it is often that, especially fueled by higher concentrations of nutrients, like raw ingredients, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus, that you're able to support ecosystems that will give you a much higher concentration of this stuff in the ambient water. If I pull a sample of water from, from the beach here in Cape Cod, I get you know six times as many um, visible chemicals in my measurements or something than I do if I take one from the middle of the ocean. Thank you. Very good, other questions for Noah? or Heather. Other questions for any of the scientists here or the artists. And also going back to all of our presentations, questions for Mesha or Greg, um, for Lori, Deb, or Heather, Caroline, Svenja, Noah, any questions for any of them. I'm looking at the chat. I'm sure everyone um, is thinking of, of different things, but sometimes the question doesn't come to mind right away, but I'm looking for if there's any hands 
raised. But, well, seeing none, we'll wrap it up. We've really covered a lot of ground tonight. And as Claudia um, said so eloquently, it's been incredibly exciting. Here's a comment from Charlotte saying, I'm overwhelmed by the creativity of all the presenters. And a, a comment from Kathy Seta, just wanna thank everyone, brilliant presentations. And I certainly agree with that. Um, so thank you to everyone for coming tonight. And, uh, and especially my hats off to all the presenters, to Mesha and Greg and Lori and Deb and Heather. And of course, for Caroline and Svenja and Noah. And we're just so pleased to have um, so many of the artists and scientists here. And we'll certainly look forward to continuing to enjoy these wonderful pieces. And I know for me, and I've been looking very closely at them for a couple of weeks now, this has just added so much to my understanding of them. Um, here's another comment, fabulous program, creative people on all levels, opened up a whole new world to us all. And I think that's definitely the case. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. We hope we'll see you around here at the Falmouth Arts Center. Um, come by, we're open every day, uh, free, and, and send, send your friends and family over to see these three amazing exhibits, four exhibits, if we count the Circe show, which is also here. And here's another comment, as a fellow Synergy artist, I'm inspired by what you are doing I think we're all inspired today. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. We hope to see you soon and have a great night. Thank you all. <laughs>